some critical voices from the audience suggesting that we were just offering yet another arena for talking about problems and that they found no hopes for real action that would lead to any actual change. After that, we decided to make a seminar in the series on activism. And the question is, is then activism the answer? And this seminar, as you hear, will be conducted in English and in Russian with English translation. Yes, I will introduce the <laughs> Helena Isaacson, our interpreter. Thank you so much for helping us. So, we have invited four very interesting artists for this discussion, and uh, definitely they work with different methods, they work with different tools, different subjects, and also different contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I would do like a short presentation of each one of them, I hope it's kind of somehow correct. We'll start with uh, Luzine and Alexei. Thank you so much for coming and bringing your children also very welcome too. Uh, you are a member of the Pussy Riot Collective, which perhaps needs very little introduction. Uh, since the, the protest song in the Moscow Cathedral in 2012 where some of your friends were imprisoned, it's been a huge, wide international coverage of what you do. When we invited you uh, in December, we were just into a, an interesting con conversation about art. At that time we were expecting uh, some sort of answer from the Swedish Immigration Office for your request. Uh, uh, of, of state permit here. Uh, unfortunately, and this is something really sad, we know that your uh, application has been rejected, which makes this situation a bit odd. I mean, we feel really, really sorry for you, and it, it feels difficult also to sit here and talk about uh, art when, when I am sure you have much, much uh, tense situation, huge problem to deal with. So we thank you very much for participating tonight. I'm sure you will touch on this topic later. Okay, Tuka Voodoo sitting at my right. Uh, you're an artist too. I have to quote because some, you know, some of the things you say are so interesting that I don't want to misspell them. <laughs> uh, you're interested in the concept of transformation and reinvention. Mm -hmm. uh, you have used aesthetic body and biological modification working with yourself yes. mm. uh, and you have said this is a quote that my dream is to one day recreate myself and become a different kind of human one who broke all the gender rules uh, and one which would not fit, fit into any such frames i'll leave it because you will have talk more about yourself later. And last, Adam Kraft, sitting in the middle. <laughs> Welcome, Adam. Okay. Uh, you are an artist and also a PhD student at, at Konspax, so you're somehow local. You live in Berlin, and you come to join this seminar. Uh, again here, you work, uh, and this is your own words, in a transgressive and informal way. You have a whole idea about one's right to the city and that this right needs to begin with the right to imagine the city. Mm -hmm. So, this was a short presentation. Uh, we have this tradition of having, we call it the letter. You know, the past seminar we've asked all our participants to read a letter to, since we are a, a art school <coughs> and we are interested in inspiring young, young people, this idea of the letter has been to, to have any participants reading something, good advice, or letters, or words of comfort, or simply uh, inspirational words to a young person who is just about to start uh, his or her uh, artistic path. Uh, to, f to sort of get free thinking and <laughs> a very sort of uh, independent artists to do things under a set, uh, set under set rules 
is not very easy, and we understand it. So honestly, I don't really, we don't really know how every participant now is going to use their own time. But we will start with you, Luzina and Alexei. I know you have prepared something, so the scene is yours. на самом главном. Поэтому такое письмо достаточно короткое, я думаю, может быть актуально и не 10 лет спустя, а даже для тех художников, которые сейчас учатся. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we received the assignment, we actually took it very seriously. And uh, as a matter of fact, it turned out to be sort of a manifesto. Then we just had to stop and uh, try to focus on the vital points. And that is why the letter became quite short. <coughs> 10 years is an increasingly short and an increasingly long period. Uh, nothing could possibly happen to during these years, and everything can happen that will change the world beyond recognition. We don't know what will happen in the next 10 years, but we know that the artist should not be afraid, that everything is already planned and nothing new will be invented. We know nothing about the coming decade, but we know that an, an artist shouldn't worry about everything that has been invented, and that nothing uh, is, uh, uh, and that nothing new uh, can be created. Напротив, все, что создано ранее, может стать отличной базой для новых открытий. On the contrary, anything that has been created could become a very good foundation for new discoveries. Вы можете отвергнуть все созданное ранее, и это тоже будет правильный выбор. You might renounce everything that has already been created, and the choice will be right, and your choice will be right as well. Не бойтесь, думайте, экспериментируйте, ищите, ищите свой язык, пользуйтесь своим языком. Fear not, reflect, experiment, search, search your own language and use it accordingly. Искусство никому ничего не должно. Никогда не бойтесь, что вас осудят. Uh, art owes you and everyone else nothing. Uh, do not ever fear others condemnation. Никогда не врите. Искусство не терпит лжи. Uh, never lie. Art that cannot stand lies. Самое главное. В мире всегда есть место для революции. Протестуйте. Искусство – самое сильное оружие. And the most important thing is that the world has always a room for a revolution. Rise up. Art is the most powerful weapon. for your manifesto, which is like a letter I would have loved to receive when I started to study art. Um, I, I have a question on this, what you're saying, when you claim that art is the most powerful weapon. Going to the Swedish context, two of our former prime minister's inauguration speeches, art was hardly mentioned. So, that's the problem of your government. Yeah, yeah, coming to my question. <laughs> uh, but if, if we look 
out at some kind of contemporary art of today in a sort of global perspective. Do you feel that we artists in general claim the position of having the most powerful tools in our hands? And if not, what is preventing us? только страх и какие-то барьеры. И, например, когда мы начинали работу над своей инсталляцией уже здесь, в Швеции, и нам многие говорили, а вы не боитесь, что у вас будет отказ? Нет, не боимся. Будет отказ от миграционки. I think that what's preventing us is uh, just fear and uh, maybe some other barriers. When we started working on our installation here in Sweden with the Swedish agency, uh, the uh, question we received most often, well, often was, uh, what if your application is denied? Thank you. Thank you. И просто нужно понять, что такое искусство да, для себя. Нужно постараться принять его силу, и тогда ты сможешь это использовать. А, понимаете, как бы, кто такой Путин? Да? Обычный мафиози, обычный босс а, мафиозной группировки. Вот. Но для него искусство оказалось страшнее, чем все санкции и чем мировое порицание. Fear not. Uh, you should understand the power of the art and use this power, utilize this power, uh, your artist's power. Uh, for example, who is Putin? He is just a, a, a mafioso, a leader of a mafia uh, group. And uh, it turned out that for him, uh, the art was much more dangerous and uh, uh, actually more horrible than all the sanctions and uh, than he, uh, all, than all the sanctions both of И в конечном итоге в России именно художники были выбраны целью номер один для репрессий. В настоящий момент все практически все актуальные художники из России а, либо были вынуждены уехать, а, ну, либо просто прекратили And actually, ultimately, art, the artists in Russia were targeted, and all the uh, modern and relevant artists today uh, either had to leave Russia or just to switch from practicing their art to art theory. Move it uh, to the Swedish content, and uh, if we talk, uh, if, if we if we uh, talk about what uh, and whether there is anything to fear here in Sweden, because it is, there is, there are uh, things here in Sweden that we should fear. Sweden, as other countries, also has censorship. Все помнят историю с гигантским фалосом синим, который совершенно был прекрасный, появился в Стокгольме, это год назад. You all remember the story with this huge, beautiful blue penis in Stockholm uh, about a year ago. Просуществовал, в общем-то, не так долго и был закрашен. Sir, uh, the, the, uh, the life of this penis wasn't particularly long and it was painted over very soon. То есть мы видим, что простое изображение, которое встречается в искусстве с незапамятных времен. And we see that a simple image that has been existing in art from since time immemorial. Приобрело очень большую силу и настолько большую, что люди просто испугались и закрасили. 
became uh, obviously powerful or too powerful, so people uh, uh, were scared. Yes, if I was in Stockholm, I was a Swedish activist, and I just tiraged all these images and everywhere on every stall in Stockholm. And if I were a Swedish artist living in Stockholm, I would have printed this image in thousands and thousands of copies and would have put it everywhere on all, each uh, column and uh, each post, uh, each electric, uh, every, each and every column, electrical post facades, etc. Because if you fear it, it's obviously powerful and it will, give, and it will have an impact. And let's uh, let's uh, continue this conversation and let's Tuka, I'm sure you have an interesting experience of when when someone is, is putting restrictions on your own body. You were born and will live the, the first few years of your life in Iran. Then you moved to Sweden. Uh, so there are many similarities here, I'm sure about this. Please, uh, please read your... Uh, your uh, text, yeah. Is it okay? That's your turn. Uh, let me see what I have. There was. Uh, there. It was difficult to write a letter. It was very difficult. <laughs> but I did it. It's okay. I think you need the mic a little bit closer. Can you hear Tuka? No, no, we cannot. Yeah, it's something with. I speak quite well too. No. Yeah, yeah, but it's not on. There is this one. Yeah. Okay. Should I use that? Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Let's see if this is on. Mm -hmm. It's on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I speak quite well. Okay. So, I'll read my letter. When I was asked to write this letter to you, dear one, who is to read it in 10 years, I thought to myself, I believe in the power of art, as art always begins with imagination and leads to new perspectives. But then 10 years is really not a long time. What can possibly change in 10 years? I guess I'm only human, and for us humans, this pessimistic way of thinking is absolutely normal. My name is Tuka Voodoo. My parents named me Tuca, inspired by a book of poetry about Tuca, a toucan daydreaming and fantasizing about freedom while trapped in a small cage placed by window. Ever since early childhood, I understood that freedom, as unfamiliar as it was, must be something worth even dying for. I was born in 1972 in Tehran. And only about five years old when the Islamic Revolution took place. There began life under a system designed to eliminate all natural desires. All things related to the celebration of the human body was forbidden. It was the early 80s when me and my mother found the way out of the cage and moved into our new homeland. I was looking at the beautiful blue skies and its magical forest, which to this day I connect with more than any other in the world. I was ready to embrace freedom, to truly embrace my right to exist. It isn't the harsh way that I was bullied at school in my new hometown. And it wasn't the way the kids pointed and whispered and sometimes even physically examined my body in the changing room during gym classes. It isn't the constant feeling of being an outsider, something unusual, exotic, suspicious, perverse, perhaps even dangerous. And it wasn't the uncomfortable feeling of being seen as less able accomplishments and knowledge simply because I am a person of color. It isn't the fact that I'm transgender and have a body uh, which is 
very happily both female and male. No, none of the above makes me feel that I am not normal. But still, somehow, my body is trapped in the bracket of other, other than the norm, without my given consent. Could it be that this norm is a structured ideology fed into the human mind already from a very young age through thousands of hours of biased animated instructions? The human body has and still is in the battleground of the oppressor and the oppressed. Throughout history, the body has been punished for having the wrong size, gender, color, age, desires. As a result, we become both the oppressed and the oppressor to ourselves. Today, like my, uh, my uh, long search for freedom has brought me to work very closely with the human body. I have created a place in my hometown, Stockholm, where with the help of art, fantasy, and imagination, humans are transformed and recreated with exciting, unusual patterns. We are celebrating the body and expressing the will for desire, for beauty, lust, inner strength, self-love. I also enjoy using my own body to question sexuality and prejudice as a tool to educate and help create diversity in the library of accessible images of the human body on the internet. This is also my attempt of adding my oppressed body type into the complex programming of future artificial intelligence to create a variable meaning of what it is to be a normal human being. That was it. <laughs> difficult. I got like all shaky. Yeah. Uh, but you were very successful. But I did it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Toka, I have a question for you. When talking about this sort of bringing your oppressed body forward, making yourself visible and present, and also when you say that you're adding your body into the library of accept accessible images on internet, what kind of comments do you receive? Um, I had uh, some someone asked me, uh, uh, someone who really cared about me, he said, "Aren't you, aren't you afraid of posting nude photos of yourself on Twitter? Uh, isn't that very dangerous?" Um, and I thought, well, you know, uh, once upon a time uh, when I was younger and I had this feeling, uh, you know, which I was talking about earlier, um, I, I saw someone who was a, this very, very beautiful man very beautiful man, and, uh, and um, then he told me that he was actually transgender, that he was born female, and just that, that opened my mind so much. I always thought I had to die first, and then be born again to be able to live my dream. Um, so this is what, what's very important, and I have clients coming to me and feeling really odd about their bodies, even though they have transitioned, but to have this body, which is a hybrid, can feel quite shocking still because we don't have the the actual visual of different body types as much as you know male female male female and I think it's very very <coughs> visibility is very important to to take away the oddity uh, and the strange uh, from the body and and realize that okay now there are these options too because we live in a time where things are changing and we are scientifically now able to modify the body and and because now we can so it's important that we see it we see that that's possible oh it's not so odd it's okay and um and because of that i think it's not it's my duty to do this um because i i even if i can even if i can save the life of one person then it doesn't matter whatever the difficulties it might bring for me. But, but do you put yourself at risk? Do you get comments that are not from your allies or buddies, but are uh, critical or, or even? Yes, that's possible. It, is, it can be dangerous. 
uh, but I really don't care. And I really enjoy it too. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives me a boost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Look, we will talk more about this. So yes. now it's Ada. Uh, there is something you mentioned imagination, imagination, Tuka. Uh, and I'm really, really curious to, to hear you, Ada. I, mean, I know you're not going to read, perhaps. Do you have no. something else prepared for us? Mm. But you have definitely a strong take on imagination and a right to that and to apply that as you do in your work that you're going to talk now mm. about. This scene is yours. Yeah, but I you have to move from here, right? You need, huh? you need the yeah, yeah, but maybe I should say something. Yeah, you should say something. Yeah, but I really, I really agree with, with your idea that imagination is sort of the, the fundament for all change. If we can't imagine the future, we can't change the future. Um, but I thought it was a super tricky task to write this letter to an art student in the future. Mm -hmm. At first I was thinking, okay, so who's an art student? Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, impossible to answer. But then also the, the idea of addressing somebody in the future, I think it's super relevant to stay in the present mm -hmm. and possibly also uh, stay with your memories or like to look backwards. Uh, um, so instead I was thinking uh, of addressing the audience or like introducing myself because I'm uh, possibly a little bit different in this constellation here <clears throat> because I try to work with what appears to be normal but isn't, sort of, um, to work with invisibility and work with the underground as a space and as a cultural form and also the facade, for example. Um, so I wanted to just show a snippet of a, of a movie from a project that I did in Copenhagen with a friend of mine. Uh, we built our own uh, apartment beneath the central station in Copenhagen and uh, this was discovered and then the chief inspector came on TV because it was a big thing in the media because it was in times of terror alert and fear and they were asking him like okay but how was this possible we're like with we, we we thought that we were safe in the city sort of and then I said yeah it's somehow embarrassing but now we're rebuilding the central station and I can promise you that this would never be possible to do again and of course, we had to take this as, as a challenge. So we built another house. Uh, uh, and I'm going to show you just one way of entering this space. So somehow you, you yeah. even managed to show for the fragility or breaches in the system by doing so like, Yeah, this is sort of the investigation that, have, that you have to enroll with and sort of figure out, OK, so there's a gap of two hours and 15 minutes in the night where there's nobody working at stations. So this is the time where we could sort of first sort of map out the station and then find the space and then inhabit, inhabit it. Yeah. A process that we hear. Let's watch. <laughs> so let's let's move our chairs a little bit so we can watch Adam's film.
this is the central station in Copenhagen. Whoa. And we still have the apartment after 11 years. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about something. Thank you so much for such an interesting, very short talk. Is this part of your PhD project? Yeah, I'm definitely investigating sort of, and I'm hinging on your fantastic letter speaking about otherness, and I'm not working with bodies of, of otherness uh, necessarily, but definitely spaces of otherness. And when you look at, for example, Stockholm, which used to have the, the political uh, idea of becoming the cleanest city in the world, you wonder what they really want to exclude. Um, yeah, so this is what I'm concerned with. Then I have a question. Uh, what is the role of an activist in a university context? Uh, I mean, the universities I know have lots of rules and regulations, mm -hmm. safety policies, and I mean, there are all ethics. kinds of ethics and things that you have to sort of adhere to. Has it caused any friction for you? Uh, not as much as I was hoping. <laughs> I mean, it's a very normalizing structure and sort of, but of course, I mean, Konstak also has a history of sort of ethical issues. They were forming an ethical committee after Nug was uh, showing his piece when he was smashing a subway car. Uh, so of course there are all these pressures coming from everywhere. And as part of my research to sort of try to map this and understand what this is sort of actually doing to, to students at universities uh, when they're so restricted in their thinking and doing. Um, there was one more question. I forgot already. I don't think it was. No. I, we have questions. Yeah, we, we, have have questions. questions. we have lots of questions. And I will start to listen, you know, we, we want to ask you all if you feel that you're sort of part of a tradition. But I'll ask my question like this. I'm sure you have experienced a moment when seeing somebody else's art and felt like, wow, this is what I want to do. This is like the, an ecstatic experience that made you, gave you really the inspiration of working with your, with your language. And I will start with you. Uh, Luzina and Alexei, if you can, if you can tell us about that, if you can tell us who your role models are, or when you had such an inspirational moment that made you take this decision of working with art, mm -hmm. Luzina. Безусловно, это Олег Кулик, русский художник. Oleg Kulik, uh, who is a Russian artist. Um, I have like three icons for me, but it's not real icons. Uh, but well, three really, uh, really smart guys. Viti uh, Prigov, uh, Russian artist, uh, Russian uh, poet. A Russian poet. And artist. Yes, and uh, Russian uh, philosopher. Mm -hmm. And a philosopher. And a philosopher. Uh, and uh, another one, as Alec uh, I can say, and maybe he is like a, some kind of like a teacher for me, but not a, not a everywhere. <laughs> for those who don't know, can you say something that he has done or something that you like? Uh, Алекторики, он был здесь в Швеции, он здесь у вас покусал какого-то очень важного господина, и после этого сказали, что не надо в Швецию больше со своим искусством приезжать. Но это как бы второй художник, принадлежащий к России, который известен в мире. То есть Илья Кабаков и Олег Кулик, примерно, составили две вещи. Oleg Kulik had actually visited Sweden once, and he uh, sort of uh, he happened to bite an important person here, and uh, uh, thereafter he was no longer welcome uh, in Sweden. Uh, there are two artists in Russia of this caliber, and that's Oleg Kulik, and the second one is Ilya Kabakov. Uh, 
Ну и третий человек, который, наверное, ну, оказал на меня какое-то влияние, но и до сих пор оказывается, я знаю, будет продолжать просто в силу своей природной смелости и откровенности. Это Александр Бреннер. Да. And the third role model who uh, made a major impact on me uh, because of his of his being very brave and uh, that's Alexander Brenner. Uh, no, yeah, as an artist, I cannot find other comparable role models, but having said that, I always argue with him, with Brenner. Известная была его работа, ну, как бы, которая понятна, может быть, западному зрителю, западной аудитории. А он нарисовал знак доллара на одном из полотен Казимира Малевича в музее. And one of his works that uh, I guess uh, would uh, be appreciated by the Western uh, audience, uh, he once painted uh, a dollar on uh, Kazimir Malevich's painting. He was also the first of Russian uh, painters, uh, auctionists, who actually uh, uh, um, ran into a church, stormed, sorry, stormed uh, uh, one of the churches. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in 1994, like that, and uh, it was Yelokhovska church in Moscow, and he screamed Chechnya, Chechnya, because at that time the Yeltsin began the war with Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya, mm -hmm. no, during the war. It was before, I'm sorry. <laughs> we move forward. Uh, Tuka, I know you wrote about your encounter in London in a tattoo studio, but I, I, I'm just curious to hear about your, your role models. My role models? Oh, ooh, or your inspirational moment. My, okay? Yeah. Um, I would say what, what I find very interesting is what you can achieve with tattooing. Um, so I, I try to use tattooing not in a sense that most people would be familiar with, and in a sense that you have an image of something and you put that image onto someone.
you have another take on the type of tattoo you're talking about, it's, it's, a, it's a different one. Would you say so? And I'm, I'm interested in what it can do to the human body and the, and the mind, the spirit, and, and, and everything. And I'm interested in actually um, not maybe put an image of something onto someone, but actually use patterns. As if you see the, the person as an animal. So what are these patterns that will suit you as a being, as an animal? And what can we do to, to bring out? We all have alter egos, uh, a, a superhero, super powerful person inside of us, a deity or a god. And it's interesting to bring that out through uh, choosing the right patterns. Yeah. Last, is it, do you know if it, tattoo is permitted in, in Iran? I, I believe that it's now I don't have much contact uh, with the country. I would say now because it's been so many years, so I can't say, I can't tell you the the whole truth. But I think it's forbidden. Yeah. But I, I can't be on the situation. It's a country that controls it. Think it should be forbidden. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So Adam. Thank you, Adam. You. Did, when did you have like an epiphany in terms of? Countering art that clicked with you. It feels like I'm the troublemaker in the class <laughs> a little bit because I'm also sitting here wondering, yeah, but uh, what is art and what what is activism, sort of? And there's like we don't have all night, but I but I'm also ambivalent about sort of uh, uh, giving out my my at least early inspirations because I grew up painting graffiti and this was sort of my world and this was the narrative that I used in the city to navigate and to sort of read and uh, which was very helpful uh, but I'm also very critical towards the culture because as you, when you look at it if you come from a sort of a critical culture position and look at it it's pretty much mimicking capitalism I mean it's highly individual uh, it's competitive super competitive um, and it's also built on a strong patriarch culture, sort of. So um, this is why I say that I'm ambivalent. But of course, if you trace back backwards in history, you can see what the provosts were doing in Amsterdam in the 50s and 60s and the situationists. But also, I think it's it's problematic to, to become sort of too retromantic, as you say, or even retromantic, like looking what happened in the past. Because if you try to mimic this, it's, it's doomed to fail. And as we know, the culture is very quickly getting co-opted and, and recuperated by, by the capitalist machinery. So I think you, you have to remain fluid and sort of be aware of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of that process. But of course, like bits and pieces of it are s still strong. Like so it, being, being part of a tradition, what does it mean to you? You already said it, but can you be part of a tradition? You don't want to be that. That I don't want to be a part of a tradition, I mean. That's a tricky question, isn't it? No, it's an easy question. You, know? <laughs> okay. you answered already. You did, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. I think you, I, I mean, you, to, to, as you say, perhaps when things start, they're fresh and new and quite commonly and fast, they become absorbed. And, mm -hmm. and uh, now I'm just answering for you. No. It's not the point, but I interpret it that way. Then I can correct you instead. Of <laughs> like, correct, yeah. No, no, but it's, no. yeah. it's an interesting idea. So, uh, the second question for, for me, for to all of you, is this. Uh, you know, I'm sure that the general perspective of people like you who, who really do take risk, who do take personal risk, who sacrifice things that you're like altruist to really just give. And I wonder, because I'm sure, I, I'm sure you do have some, some moment uh, of uh, satisfaction, let's say, on a personal level. And I want to ask you what that satisfaction is. How does that satisfaction look like in all these risks you take? Bazid and Alexei, start with you, okay? <coughs> Я уже почти забыла это ощущение, но это, наверное, то ощущение, когда 
ты обсуждаешь акцию в самых дичайших условиях, когда отложены телефоны все э, подальше, и э, ты находишься где-нибудь в, в сауне, где высокая температура, и только там, без телефонов, тебя могут не послушать. И только вот в таком э, режиме обсуждения акций и была, возможна акция в Сочи в 2014 году. I actually almost forgot the feeling, but uh, uh, let's say when you discuss an action that you are going to undertake in the most impossible situation and you are afraid that your phone is tapped, so you put away your phone and you sit in a sauna because there uh, the temperature is very high and there are no phones and nobody can tap into your conversation and that's how we uh, managed to plan our action during the Olympics in Sochi in 2014. либо случаи, когда мы уже обсуждали наши акции с Алексеем, то есть просто находясь в комнате, писали друг другу, ничего не говорили, зная, что прослушивающее устройство может быть даже в нашей квартире. And uh, another example is when we were discussing uh, com our coming plans, uh, sitting or standing in the river water, and we left our phones on the beach, so uh, nobody would be able to eavesdrop on us. And when I discussed with Alexei, and we are in the same room, we do not talk, we write to each other. И вот то самое удовлетворение было только после того, как картинка с акцией, пусть даже это 5 секунд, появлялась в сети. Для русских художников-акционистов важно было, чтобы кто-то, друг, которому ты доверяешь, успел это сфотографировать и отправить в интернете. И, в принципе, тогда можно было сказать, что акция удалась. Felt, uh, that I felt was when the picture was actually uh, shown and uh, could be seen on uh, uh, online or on the internet. And uh, the greatest satisfaction and a very important issue is that you have a trustworthy friend that has enough time uh, or has enough skill to make a picture during a very short Uh, maybe during a couple of minutes or seconds and be able to post it online. That's the deepest satisfaction. О мигрантах, о том, как Швеция относится к мигрантам, как к животным. Мы делали об этом выставку. Вот мы ее сделали, и вроде бы как бы вот все, да, вот все состоялось. Вроде бы ты должен чувствовать удовлетворение, что ты реализовал этот проект. Uh, this kind of a feeling of satisfaction, it's a, a very uh, short-lived feeling. For example, uh, here in Sweden, we were, uh, we were working on the exhibition, on the project of an exhibition uh, to demonstrate Uh, this uh, the Swedes attitude towards migrants like uh, they uh, uh, they handle migrants as if they were animals and that was also a satisfaction when uh, the project uh, was completed but it was a very short-lived satisfaction Uh, вот это удовлетворение от состоявшегося проекта уходит, и ему на место приходит какой-то критический взгляд. Ты понимаешь, что ага, это можно усилить, это можно сделать еще больше. Ты набираешь еще дальше какого-то материала, чтобы дальше работать, развивать ну, эту идею. Да? And as we are still in this situation, uh, living within the situation, and 
uh, we have this satisfaction after the completed project, but we want more. So we continue to collect more material, more material, uh, and so on and so forth. So in any case, you can't feel the final satisfaction of what it was, because you continue to work, you continue to think, think about something, and think about something. Допустим, не, не эта тема, которая у тебя была, ты, значит, думаешь искать что-то дальше, что-то другое. То есть это вечный процесс. Да? I think it's impossible to reach any kind of an ultimate satisfaction, because you are an artist, and you are always thinking, you are always reflecting, you are always contemplating, and if not on the same subject, not on the same issue, then a different issue. So there is like no way of any sort of a final satisfaction. Вот. И если говорить о нашей работе, работа называлась The World is Yours, о Швеции, да, о современной, это работа о современной Швеции, то, наверное, мы почувствуем какое-то такое серьезное удовлетворение, когда в Швеции начнется что-то меняться. А когда беженцы начнут какие-то получать реальные права здесь, когда к ним будут относиться как к равноправным людям. Вот в этот момент, наверное, мы будем чувствовать какую-то удовлетворение. Uh, the, the world is yours, the project I, I mentioned before. So and, and as speaking about satisfaction related to the project, maybe we will start feeling more sa uh, satisfied when refugees uh, will get rights in Sweden, when things uh, start changing in Sweden, when, refuge, when the attitudes toward, towards refugees won't differ from the attitude towards uh, uh, towards the citizens of this country. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> То есть это такая хорошая страна, что если ты здесь беженец, ты не можешь поселиться в гостиницу, потому что у тебя нет ID карты. Тебя просто выгонят. Хорошо, что у меня были права с собой водительские российские. And in this wonderful country, uh, where a refugee or an asylum seeker cannot uh, uh, stay at the hotel because he or she doesn't have uh, a relevant ID card. Uh, luckily, I had my driving license, so I was able to stay at the hotel. Ну, справедливости ради, это был первый такой случай, но случай очень неприятный. Если ты себя чувствуешь человеком даже не третьего сорта, а даже вообще себя человеком не чувствуешь. Uh, just for, just as I want to. Uh, be fair, I have to tell you that that was the first uh, such occasion, but still, uh, I want to feel as a human being, not as uh, some kind of a uh, uh, person of, uh, like, uh, of no rights. Папа Лусине, он в свое время сказал очень замечательную фразу, он у нее гений. Uh, он сказал, что художник всегда должен быть иждивенцем. Uh, and we, if we speak about altruism, I want uh, here to develop this idea further, and I want to quote Lucinia's fa uh, father, who is a genius, and he once said, an artist should always be supported by somebody else. Otherwise, he won't. He or she won't be an artist. I say thank you so much. We need time to for the other to ask. I'm really happy to hear that you have satisfaction both in the making and the after when you get the results. I appreciate the Zin's comment about standing in the river in the sauna because that's really when you are in the making of something and not only getting satisfaction when something is done and it's completed. So. Tuka, your turn. Satisfaction. You said, said you got satisfaction yeah. even from bad comments. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, I think else? I think it seems that the uh, when it comes to all of us, I think the, there is a satisfaction into breaking into these walls 
uh, and I think that's the moment with you know with you sneaking into this place where you're not supposed to be to film this uh, incredible film that we watched, which doesn't have a, a sort of a, a very clear particular message, but it just is, and that's what's so interesting to 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 see that. Uh, and, and uh, you same thing work. for me, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, for me to sneak in to break this wall that says no, you can't enter, you can't be yourself, you can't be unique, you can't, you know, uh, love your body, express your sexuality, and break, and then uh, and actually get the images across, and not in a in a aggressive way where I have a point to make and I must make my point, but. To, to just show that we just want to be and give you this perspective into this thing. Uh, and it's, it's just art. It's not, it's not uh, we're not trying to create uh, aggression or fight, but it just is. So take a moment and just calmly watch it and maybe it will uh, awaken new thoughts in you and uh, bring out sides within you which you didn't even know exist. You know, and, and I, I like doing that with uh, just manipulating uh, human body, the human body with uh, these, uh, with patterns and uh, create, uh, creating this feeling of self-love within them. Because you, you, yeah. you help people with that and you do it with yourself. Exactly, yeah. How, yeah. explain the different type of satisfaction when you're for other people um, when you do it for When I do it in others, I it gives me great satisfaction when I look at them and I can see that they love themselves just a little bit more. <laughs> I really love that. Yeah. And and with myself too. I, I guess it's it's had that effect within me. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Adam. Oh, that, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, oh, that was loud. Question. <laughs> question is when you get satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you, I mean, the film you showed. Yeah, but just to hinge back again to an imagination, I think. When you're sort of able to regain some kind of an imagination again, because as I said, most of the imagination has either gone into sort of an interference of fear that we imagine like fearing the other, or it's been sort of colonized by consumer culture that we, uh, we imagine ourselves laying on a beach at Lanzarote or sort of have this flight and then come back again. Uh, but when I'm sort of either able to, uh, to sort of break my own uh, imaginary borders, I, th I, th I think this is very satisfying. Um, but also I have this thing that, I, that I'm triggered by uh, engaging with the with what is seemingly impossible, like and, and to really like, for example, I was I was moving a house uh, of of a thousand kilos, uh, first by hand on the train tracks, with my friend Ibi Itso, and we had this idea to move it to the edge of the world, uh, and we actually managed in the end. Sort of, it took us seven years. A house? Yeah, a house of like a small house, like a cabin. But sort of achieve the seemingly what at first seemed impossible, and sort of just to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway says, to really fight for something and not just going to the next project, the next project, but sort of remain and sort of not give up. And it took you, have said, how long? It took us seven years. I mean, it's still a work in progress, but we started in 2008, and, and I mean, now it's at the end, end of the Eurasian continental plate. And for us, this is sort of the edge of the world. Um, so this is really rewarding when you sort of keep fighting with something and then sort of finally sort of break through the, the brick wall. I think this is very sort of very re rewarding. You know. I, I can imagine. Great. I, I think we should up, open up for questions. I'm sure we have lots of questions from the audience. And if you don't have any questions, we will come up with other ones. Yeah. I can hardly see you. <laughs> so, yeah. And if somebody wants to say something in Swedish, I can also translate. I can, I can ask in, in English. 
Well, I was reading, you know, the, the introduction into this uh, discussion, and uh, I, I, I was, uh, was fascinated by one quote, how can art save the world? And then I was thinking, climate change. Could you speculate a little bit on that? How art can, so to say, help to maintain the climate? Someone is interested in talking about climate change and art? Is it I, I would just like, I mean, I was also troubled by this sort of, uh, this, uh, this question, can art save the world? Because I was first thinking, yeah, but should art save the world? Uh, yeah, and then of course, uh, does art really make a difference when it stays within its domain? I think the art gets powerful when it's sort of becoming unexpected and not sort of, sort of in a confirmed space where you go to have sort of a, another vision and then you, you step out again. But I think the, the power lies when it's sort of a social practice, but it's when that's coming when it's unexpected. And of course, this has to be an art practice, okay, whatever this is. Also have to address issues of sustainability, for example. When I'm saying stay with the trouble, um, I think this is one way of dealing with it, to sort of not produce the new, the new, as I was saying before. I mean, of, of course, this is my posture that, that, that climate change is triggered by capitalism. So we also have to see what art does in this machinery, sort of what we are partaking in by sort of, uh, you know, creating this surplus of value. Yeah, comments. comments, otherwise we move on. Yeah. 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 Еще есть другой пример, чуть-чуть поменьше, но тоже социалистическая страна, где сейчас вроде бы что-то начало тоже меняться к лучшему, а, которая продала столько нефти, что я не, я не знаю, какое количество ее сгорело и что она сделала с климатом. And another exa example from another socialist country, where hopefully uh, there would be some improvement in the nearest future, the country, the, the socialist country, that has sold so much oil that it almost burned itself alive. Можно далеко не ходить. У вас здесь под боком есть еще одна страна, которая не то социалистическая, не то капиталистическая, и то же самое продает нефть налево направо, влияет на климат, будет здоров. You have another country very close by. It's uh, uh, difficult to say whether the country is capitalist or it is or is it socialist, but it is also selling tremendous amounts of oil. We can go even closer to Switzerland, where there are very developed, good, well-developed ecological brands, clothes, from Serbia and so on. Uh, но эти материи оставляют после стирки частицы микропластика, которые убивают китов, убивают морских животных, и, наверное, это тоже влияет на изменение. И если мы смотрим uh, sort of uh, leave a sediment of microplastic, so which is probably not so good either. Mm -hmm. And uh, this microplastic actually is killing animals and fish. Okay. Uh, can I respond to yeah, the, uh, the dichotomy between yeah. communist and capitalist? Because I think this is really where we have to start imagining otherness. Because we can't stay or like comparing these two systems as the only two alternatives. We have to sort of imagine the future uh, in a different way. Whether this is uh, an anarchist posture, a social anarchist posture, posture that I'm promoting. I have to, I have to come closer to you. No, uh, uh, but I think this is the challenge, of course, how we can imagine the future without being stuck in the shadow of the past. Mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, of course, uh, 
of course there are troubles maybe I'm Eurocentric here only addressing capitalism but this is a sort of my reality or what I'm what is sort of uh, uncomfortable for me to partake in uh, but we have to see further than this dichotomy between these two dominant systems the power of imagination. Please, let, let's take some more questions so that we can involve the, the, the audience. Is there any other question? Yeah? Okay. It's very important. Я думаю, что вопрос нужно ставить не может ли искусство что-то сделать или не сделать, да, а могут ли художники. That the question should be formulated differently, not whether the art can do something or help, can have an impact, but whether the artists can make a difference. Thank you. Questions here. Um, thank you. It's really interesting. I was just thinking about commonalities between the artists on stage and the, the idea of ritual seems to be something that fits loosely with everybody, either the rituals of the home in the domestic space, or the work of both Pussy Riot and the earlier form of Ivanya, the, the earlier group. Also, I've seen some of the work with the dinner, the dinner on the train in the Moscow metro. And then Tucker's work, of course, I think is very steeped in ritual. And I wonder if that's a, maybe a set, a way of deconstructing capitalism or working with ways of saving the world or whatever by changing thought patterns, changing behaviors through ritual. I wonder if anybody has anything to say about that. Right. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> like you're looking at you, everybody like, look, look. bring it in. I think uh, uh, um, for us humans to sort of uh, take in things, uh, we almost need a ritual. So we have this need for rituals, yes. Um, and uh, maybe maybe uh, the ritual is a way to connect with a pagan past, a past where we have more uh, respect and love for nature and environment and, uh, and the base, the base of things, the root of things, uh, instead of being sort of uh, distracted by it. Um, all else. So yeah, maybe that is, uh, this could be quite powerful. Yeah. I would say that we are sort of uh, soaked in rituals as it is. And those rituals are, of course, having to be replaced by new rituals or new behaviors or so we have to deconstruct uh, the way we're programmed at the moment, of course. Which so rituals are you, are you thinking about? Which, when you say we're soaked with rituals, what are you thinking? No, but I mean, I, th right. I, th I think you have to have sort of a holistic view on change and of course we have a certain uh, behavior that we have to break with and this probably has to be replaced by new rituals because this is how humans work or uh, so I'm not thinking that we are especially unique sitting here we're unique because we're sitting on a stage with with Janet Jackson uh, microphones in our faces but otherwise uh, um, we have to, sh of course, we all have rituals. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I actually didn't really understand, couldn't really understand your question. Uh, it, it was probably the interpreter's fault because the interpreter didn't, <laughs> couldn't understand it either and couldn't hear it very clearly. It was about rich rituals. Rituals and the, the power of rituals and the, the relevancy of rituals, maybe. And I just from paying attention to everybody's work, I thought it maybe it was a way of bringing the discussion together regarding the idea of saving the world, or changing things, maybe simpler. <laughs> Uh, I see nothing in, uh, in common uh, between the rituals and saving the world. Uh, you are now filming with your phone, so it's also a ritual. You want to have some memory from this mm -hmm. meeting. This is for other people. 
Ну, или для других людей, да, чтобы им показать что-то, да. You want to show it to other people. Вот. А если говорить об этом как ритуале, и как о ритуале, то, что вы покажете это другим людям, может быть, они посмотрят это, задумаются о том, что мы здесь говорили, и, и может быть, да, это что-то где-то повлияет на изменение, не глобальное, но локально где-то в чем-то сознании. Uh, then let's continue. You might show uh, what you were filming to other people, and maybe they will start contemplating on what uh, you've showed them, and maybe uh, it will lead to some changes, not, not global changes, but maybe local changes. Maybe they will start thinking in some different perspective. Да, наверное, он будет влиять и будет способствовать каким-то глобальным изменениям в мире. Потому что это очень важно. Any question to Luzin? His last chance to hear you talking. Uh, come back, please. <laughs> Про ритуалы. Я хочу сказать, что мне кажется, что мы, если говорить о российском акционизме, мы даже uh, вели какую-то борьбу с ритуалами. И всегда пытались uh, что-то противостоять чему-то мощному, огромной машине, которая государственный аппарат, которая, естественно, имеет деньги, влияние, и противостоять вот этой машине просто, можно сказать, голыми руками и стараться, наоборот, разрушить эти ритуалы, потому что это государственный аппарат, это, естественно, это ритуал пропаганды, это ритуал насаждения некой цер неких церковных устоев, это постоянное как бы такое зомбирование людей и вдруг появляются какие-то нищие совершенно And uh, uh, our goal was to resist these rituals with our bare hands, to destroy them and to liberate the people because these rituals, they are the state, they are the church, and... propaganda. Uh, um, Uh, they, uh, they are making propaganda and they want to make, pe to, to turn the people into zombies. И, например, самый яркий пример, с которым всегда представляет группа Пусирайт, это акция в церкви. И в, если вспомнить исторически, почему она сложилась, то она сложилась именно потому, что были так называемые ритуалы. То, что Владимир Путин привез в Москву, я не знаю, как это переводится на другие языки, но мощи. Это был несколько вот это, пояс, да, и пояс святые кости, и пояс Богородицы. И выстроились огромные пояс Богородицы. Да, пояс. Да, может быть, это переведете? Все. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, famous uh, Pussy Riot's action was the action in the church. So why in the church? Uh, because that was uh, the church st uh, stood for a ritual back then Putin brought to Moscow the holy bones of uh, some kind of a saint as well as Um, the belt that uh, uh, yeah, people claimed uh, belonged to the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Те многотысячные очереди и образовались в Москве, несмотря на сильный мороз. 
И в то же время обращение патриарха, который сказал, что истинный верующий никогда не пойдет протестовать, он придет в церковь. And the Russian patriarch, he said that uh, the, belie the true believers won't protest. He only can, uh, came into the church, and the Russian artist came into the church. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one last question. Who is the brave one? Take a chance. Then I think we say thank you so much. Lucine, Alexei, Helena, Adam, Tuka, thank you so much. And these wonderful kids. <laughs> 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 <laughs>